I am. Uh, okay. So what I wanted to talk about today was a tool that is available through the Realtor Property Resource that would assist you in valuing different kinds of investment properties. Now, the tool is actually got lots of different layers to it, and it could be used on different kinds of commercial properties. You could use it on a flip. You could use it on a multifamily. Um, each of those different kinds of properties, when launched, the tool modifies itself to accommodate those kind of properties. What I'm going to pretty much focus on is the ones that most residential agents need to deal with, which would be either somebody who's interested in buying a property in order to flip it, or somebody interested in buying a property for rental purposes. And the rental purposes could include a condominium, it could include a townhouse, a single family home, but it could be a multifamily residential property. And I think we're gonna maybe do one of those, right? Does that sound, does that sound like fun? Um, so let's start with a multifamily residential property. Let's just start with that. So I'm using Matrix, depending upon where you are, your software may be a little bit different. Um, in some areas you use Paragon, in some areas people are using Repitoni, that's the name of the software. Many of us are using Matrix, either one that looks just like this or a version that looks like this. But let's start with a multifamily property, right? And let's assume that you have a client who's interested in buying let's go with a fourplex, right? Um, now the same kind of analysis would be done on a duplex or a triplex. Um, when you hit five or more, you're now talking about commercial grade multifamily residential property, which changes the loans, right? So Golden One Credit Union, I see Jody Hatano is online. Um, she could make a loan for a duplex, a triplex, a fourplex, but not a 20 unit apartment building. And I work with a different lender who only does commercial properties, won't do up to four units, it's gotta be more, but then the loan amount, the, the loan to value ratio changes, the way in which they qualify you changes, the interest rate changes, it's very different. So we're going to stick with a multifamily residential property that would be handled by lenders that you already know, or maybe, oh, maybe. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for some. So we're gonna go up to residential and we're gonna go to multi-unit. Oops, we're gonna go to residential and multi-unit and multi-family search. Now notice the two choices are commercial multifamily, which would be five or more units, or just a multi-family, which would be two to four units we're going to keep it kind of you know, simple. Now, again, you could pick whatever it is your client is looking for. Let's say it's a fourplex. We're gonna put in it's active and your client, I'm assuming that you have a client who says, I'd like to buy a fourplex. They may have a budget, right? They may have a budget. And let's just see what happens if we put in $2 million or less. Right now there's 445, did I do that right? Yes, I think so, 445. And let's say I only want to look at properties that are in San Jose, California. Now, how many do we have? Seven, right? I happen to know that in San Jose, fourplexes are oftentimes more than $2 million, but we don't need everyone. We just want to, you know, just want to see how this works. So here are the fourplexes for sale, active listings in San Jose under $2 million. They range from a bottom of 1.5 to a top to almost two. Let's just look at one, right? Now I like, by the way, the ones that have the real here because it means that they have a virtual tour, which may give us more information about the condition of the property, but let's just take a look at this beauty, right? So um, it's been on the market 51 days. Don't turn your nose up at that. 
these kind of properties are often on the pro are often on the market much longer than single family homes. I would be looking at this. There's two separate duplexes on one large lot. That's not an uncommon thing where you have it's a they, it's built as a fourplex, but it's not one structure. It's two structures. I've seen that quite a, a lot. ADU plans have been drafted. That would be something we might want to know about because if you can put in an accessory dwelling unit, one or two, then that could be rented out and that might change our numbers. Uh, owner pays for gas and uh, water while tenants pay for electricity. That would be useful for us to know when we're running the numbers. Um, and that's for building 398, 402, owner pays for tenants pay for gas and like It's a little bit different. Now, what we uh, I do is I scroll down, and this one is actually nice, right? I like this. <laughs> and the reason that I like it is because, first of all, they're telling us right away how much the rent is, <clears throat> and all of these units are rented. I did not do this in advance, right? I wasn't scoping these out. A lot of times you'll see that one of the units, um, sometimes more than one of the units, there's nothing listed for rent. And the reason is either the owner lives in one of the units or a tenant has moved out, they're renovating it or something like that. Now, one of the questions that you would wanna ask yourself is, are these realistic? Are these market rates for rent? All right, now these are small one ones and a two one, and you might want to see whether or not that rent is something that could be increased over time. How would you do that? Well, um, I actually subscribe to a company where it's called Rentometer. Um, I have a you know a subscription for this, and it essentially allows me to run rent comps for a given area, and it even gives you a little meter and it gives us um, branding. And for those of you that are on my team or in my group, if you're trying to come up with rent comps, uh, let me know, I would help you with it. Otherwise, we look and see what other fourplexes are being rented for. And you could go to rent.com, there's um, the Rent Cafe, there's a lot of different sources. Even Zillow will tell you what rents are often like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let, let's just do, um, so Rent Cafe, San Jose. So Rent Cafe, San Jose gives us a rough idea of what rents are going for, right? And the average apartment size is 884, average rent is 297. Um, it's also, most of these are probably not one ones. It talks about 94% uh, of them are in excess of $2,000. It shows trends, uh, rents, so if you didn't know, are, are going up. It has different neighborhoods, what the average rent is, what are the most affordable. And so this is something you might wanna look at, right? Just so that you can get an idea, because we want to think about this. Are, are those rents, first of all, um, be, even under rent control, you can raise the rent by up to 10% a year, right? If you do it too far, then other, you know, you're gonna lose tenants. But one of the things that we would want to consider before we do this analysis is what are these rents like, right? Now let's just assume let's just assume that these rents are, um, are are in line, right? Because one of the things that we would be looking at is could we raise the rent, right? But let's just assume they are now. What I The reason I was so happy when I saw this <laughs> is because many times when real estate agents put in duplex, triplex, and fourplex, they don't put in all the information. And for example, they don't even tell you what the gross income is. They don't do that, right? So what you have to do is add this all together, right? And sometimes I do that even when they tell me gross income, and I'll show you why. So we have 2258 plus 2258 
plus 2400 plus 2048, uh, and we hit enter. So what we're, I, I think I made a mistake here. Let me try this again. Um, 2258 plus 2258, I hit an equals rather than the addition, 2400 plus 2048. $8,964 a month is what it's bringing in. Now, they're telling us that the income gross schedule, this is this number down here, that the gross schedule is 107,568. Now, what growth schedule means is essentially it's the dollars that we could get if every unit was rented and everybody paid the rent on time. Now you'll notice for their vacancy factor, they're using 3%. Now, what we oftentimes will do is, where's my calculator, is we'll take the gross monthly number and we'll multiply it by 11, which is 98,604. Why would we do that? And the answer is because not everybody pays the rent on time. And what happens if we have a tenant who stops paying rent and we have to evict them? So this number, this factor varies depending upon different kinds of investors. Sometimes they have their own ideas about this, but it's a general rule of thumb that we would assume that we're gonna lose one month's rent every year as a result of vacancies and uncollected rent. Now they're using a 3% factor. It is true that right now the rental market is pretty good, right? There are more renters in California than homeowners. Um, that's unlikely to change. Uh, many times you'll see people using a 5% vacancy factor as a general assumption overall. But if we were going to buy this and we wanted to make sure we didn't lose money, we might lower the annual gross income to reflect a higher vacancy factor. So one of the things you have to look at is how did they come up with this number? And the vacancy factor is one of the things obviously we'd look at. Now, a lot of times, and we'll look at a couple of other listings, but a lot of times none of this information is filled out, right? You're lucky that the agent told you what the rent is. You're lucky they did that. And if they did that and didn't tell me any of this, I would simply take the gross monthly rent, multiply it by 11, and I would be using that number once we do an analysis. Now, they're giving us numbers, which is nice. What is the utilities and trash and other, whatever that is, and maintenance and insurance, um, real estate taxes, right? And we're going to take a look at that. Now, the real estate taxes of 23,152, um, that's cool. And uh, the same rules that apply to residential property taxation apply to commercial property taxation. And the rule I'm, I'm focusing on is the one that says that the maximum amount the county tax assessor can assess you, increase your tax assessment in any 12 month period is 2%. So we would, without going into the details as to when these people bought it, what I'm going with this is that when your client buys this property, it's going to be reassessed, right? And the reassessment is going to use the purchase price of the property, which means that that number for real estate taxes could go up and potentially it could go up a lot. Now, what I'm going to do for just, you know, for funsies, and usually when I'm doing something like this, I'll be taking notes to the side because it's a whole lot easier. It's a whole lot easier if you do the numbers first and get them all worked out prior to um, putting them into the software. Um, and so this is a gross minus one month, right? And so what we also are going to want to do is take a look at what would be the property taxes if we bought it. Now, look at this number here, 
the list price is $1,925,000. Let me go back to my calculator. I think it shows 8964. Let me put that number in my notes. 8964 is monthly gross. Right. And there's a reason we're going to want to know that All right. later. All right. So 1925 is the list price. Again, there are different investors have different ideas, but there are some generally accepted rules of thumb. And what, what I mean by that, one of them is the annual 10% rule. And what the annual 10% rule says, if I pay $1,925,000 for this, I ought to be getting 192000 in gross income. So many investors would be saying, well, I want to see a gross annual income equal to 10% of what I'm paying for the property. Now, we aren't getting, uh, even using their numbers and their, we're not quite getting it. Now, whether or not that is going to keep a client from buying it has to do with some other factors. And the other factors, when you're buying multifamily, there are two different ways in which you can make money. One way is to have a positive cash flow from your rentals. The other way is to have appreciation of the property such that when you sell it, you're going to make a lot of money from it. Now, I have found if I ask a client, what's most important to you? Is it a positive cash flow or is it appreciation? They'll say both. I want both. But sometimes I, I've had clients buy a duplex in Cupertino where it wasn't positively cash flowing, if that's the right way to say it. But the appreciation on this kind of property goes up a lot, right? And so they're thinking they, they could make a million dollars in 10 years when they sell it just from the appreciation. Now that we're going to be able to add in later. But you understand if we're grossing only 98,000, right? And 10% is 192, then we're not grossing as much, we're not grossing the 10%, right? And that now, is it possible that this is still a good investment? Yeah, but you might need cash, right? Or a large down payment because there may not be that much flexibility. Another way of looking at it, if we take the 1,925,000, I could have just done this from the other one, and we multiply by 0.01, oops, then that's 1%. And so another one of these general rules of thumb is, is that the monthly income ought to equal 1% of the price. And I've had clients who told me um, Santa Clara County up to 20 units. If it has one per, if the, if the monthly gross income is equal or greater to 1% of the price, they would buy it. And they told me that the, the amount was not an issue, right? In other words, they didn't care if it was 10 million or five, they didn't care. Um, there was no ceiling on that if it had a gross monthly rent of 1% of the price, and they were paying cash, they were all in on it, right? And you're going to see that if we're not getting uh, a large enough spread, it may be difficult to finance this property. All right. Um, some of the numbers you might want to look at, um, when I get into the actual um, software, when it's asking things like closing costs when you sell it and stuff like that and insurance quotes you know where do i get that from and i use an app that i got from lin dang with chicago title which estimates buyer and seller closing costs including insurance and things like that which is something that that i would use let's see um gross yield rent gross rent multiplier there's a lot of different terms for this. This whole concept falls into gross multiplier 
and there's gross monthly multipliers and there's gross annual multipliers. Right? And um, but anyhow, and different investors have different ideas, right? They they want different things. All right. So let's say, yeah, this is the one we want, right? This is what we want. And what I'm going to probably do is uh, we'll we'll so anyhow <laughs> scroll up. And where this icon is located, again, depends upon the software you're using, but it's there if you're in California and you're part of the Real Estate Alliance, which most of you are. But you'll see there's this little colorful icon here, which says Real Pro Realtors Property Resource. And when we click on that, what it's going to do is open the property in RPR. Now, although it is possible, to run a multifamily search in RPR, what I've noticed is because the information in RPR is syndicated through a lot of different levels that the details, like these details here, usually do not appear in RPR. They're in the MLS, right? And we want to, you know, pay attention to who's paying what and that sort of thing. It depends upon how finely we want to tune our analysis. But anyhow, here we are. It's beautiful, right? And we can, we can, one of the things that I would look at is the, um, I would, so they've given us some information about the rent, but two units are, um, anyhow, but notice they're, there they are. They actually included the rent. That's cool, but they didn't necessarily include any of the expenses, which is something we're going to want to see. Uh, tax information, the total tax amount was 15,000. What's it going to be? Well, uh, again, I would be using the Chicago Title app, but 1,925,000, let's assume that it's one and a quarter percent it means we're gonna be up to 24,062. Um, CRMLS, Nicole, RPR is connected there someplace. And if you're having trouble finding it, which again, I would have to look at CRMLS. I, I believe that CRMLS has a matrix option, which means it looks somewhat like this. If you just, copied the address and then went to RPR and put it in, you're going to find it. But um, I can't, you know, speak for every MLS, but I know that in the ones where I work, it's there. Yeah, and of course, CR MLS has RPR. If you're a member, if you are a realtor, right? If you're for real, a realtor, you have access to RPR. And someplace there's a button if you can't find it, call your association of realtors or call the MLS and ask them. You're paying them a lot of money, aren't you? Aren't you? All right. So um, what? I, and it, it, what's interesting to what I just did is is that I get twenty four thousand sixty two fifty for taxes, which is one and a quarter percent. Now I would be using one of the title company's tools because they may know and and and. Um, some other taxes that might be involved. The reason I found that interesting is because over here, the taxes were 23,000, right? Which um, is looks like they're assuming the taxes if you were to buy it at their price. However, my number seems to be a little bit higher. So they're not assuming one and a quarter percent. They're assuming something else. Um, okay. So anyhow, um, and it's true that the property taxes are 1% plus debtor approved indebtedness, um, voter improved indebtedness, and it varies by city and, and areas because different areas have different voter approved indebtedness. So anyhow, that's their number and that's not the past number that's the projected number because if we look at the taxes if we scroll down to where the taxes are you can see that in the last taxed year it was 15,106 right and um, they've come up with an assessment of this uh, I, don't, I, I don't know 
anyhow, let's just move on. I might have spent more time looking at the different options, but we're going to do this one and see how it works. Right? So what we're looking for now is we want to find under additional resources a tab that says evaluate, and we're going to click on analyze the property. Now there's training. I've included a couple of links. There's not a lot of links for this. Um, RPR has some classes, some videos. They have a walkthrough. Um, you know, um, there's not a lot. A, a lot of the information comes from coming up with the right numbers in advance, but we're just going to click on continue. And the software knows what kind of property. Notice it's already jumped up here and said multifamily, right? It knows, right? Because that's how it's in RPR. But you can see there's a lot of other choices, right? Self-storage, single family. So if you were buying a property, a condo or a single family with the idea of renting it out, you could choose those choices. Um, all fields with the check mark are required. You can edit your details later. Some of them are harder to edit. Um, the scenario name, it could be right now, the default setting for the property name is the address. I would leave it that way. You could change the scenario name. So let's say your client, you know, you could say this is for uh, MJD or something like that. You, you could do it. Um, it would include the reports, both the property name as well as the scenario name. Another reason why we might be modifying this is that you might run multiple scenarios depending upon different levels of down payment, right? Because you're going to see later whether or not you're having a positive cash flow oftentimes depends on how much of a down payment, right? Because anyhow, loan costs. TTIM is the total gross potential rent. Now, again, the I oftentimes would take 11 months. Right? If you want to be careful, right, you might want to assume that not everybody is ever going to pay, they always pay the rent on time. So let's say it's 98, which I'm typing in the wrong place, that's all. 98,604, 98. 604, all right? So I'm assuming that's the income and I'm giving a, how good is an AVM for investors decision-making is a question, not very good, not very good. And the automated valuation models work much better on, um, the, often the, 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 sometimes they're not very good. So even if you look at the confidence, even though it gives you five, there's a $300,000 rate. Right, which we could use, but the up to four units, it's okay. And one of the things you could look at are the details and just look and see have there been any others that have sold and what did they sell for? Right. And here, you know, are some examples of others in the area. But as a separate thing, you would want to be running comps to see what do fourplexes in San Jose sell for. Um, duplexes, it's a little bit better. You're going to find most valuation models work better on single family condos and townhomes because there's more readily available comps. Sometimes when you run how much is the, you know, what, what, what are the, um, um, uh, sales of fourplexes in a particular neighborhood, there aren't very many. Right, and then once you start using other neighborhoods and things, it becomes you know difficult. What are the total operating expenses and reserves? All right, so you might say, well, they've already told us that, right? Because over here they've told us that the total operating expenses are thirty-two thousand four hundred and sixty-nine. Okay, all right, but um, what about reserves? Now, what we mean by reserves is what's going to happen when the refrigerator breaks? What are you going to do when a dishwasher breaks? What are you going to do when the air conditioning breaks? What are you going to do when the roof needs to be replaced? What do you, I mean, you, you get the idea. And so the reserves are normally 
reserves for the replacement of things. And again, if we're just using a general rule of thumb, many investors would say, well, I want 10% for reserves. I want 10%. So what we would do is if we were, we would take our, and, and I'm using a reduced gross income because I want, you know, the, um, I just want 11 months. Let me just look at the history here. So what number did I put in? I put in 98,604. So let me do this, 98,000. Um, I usually would use 98,604 and I'm gonna divide that by the 11. And so that's that much times 12. So this would be the assuming everybody paid their rent on time. That's what we would be getting, which is a little different from what there, but I would be saying, we're going to need 10% of that, that we would want every year to be held in reserve. Um, question, why is the income gross schedule different from the annual income gross amount? Well, gross scheduled, if you're talking about the annual gross or the scheduled gross. So the gross scheduled income is the dollars that we could get if everybody paid the rent on time and there were no vacancies. So once we know that number, that's called scheduled growth. So that would assume that all of the units are always occupied and always pay their rent on time. However, we know that is unlikely to be true. And that then from the scheduled growth, we deduct a factor for vacancies and uncollected rents. In this analysis, they deducted 3%. I'm saying it could be higher than that. Right, that's optimistic. And even if you're saying, well, it'd be easier to rent it out if somebody wanted to leave because I'm in California and San Jose is very popular. Yeah, but what if somebody stops paying their rent and you have to evict them, right? You have to hire a lawyer. Do you have to go through the eviction process? How many months could you lose just by having to do that? And so, although we don't expect that to happen every year, right? We might assume that occasionally, right? If we are being prudent, that that's going to happen. So you start with scheduled gross, which is 100% occupancy, the dollars we could get. You subtract vacancies and uncorrect collected rents as a factor, which is the dollars we won't get. And then what's left over is oftentimes referred to as effective gross, which is their 104 number, which is the dollars we will get before we deduct expenses. Right, and then the three kinds of expenses that we deduct are fixed expenses, like insurance and property taxes, variable expenses, like maintenance and things like that, and then reserves for replacement. All right, was that, apparently that was enough. Right? I've been told, I was told that that was enough. All right, I'd like to give a complete explanation. So where I'm going with this, is that I may not believe, oops, let me, let me go back here, that their expenses are only going to be 32,000, right? Because I don't see anything on that list where we would be putting aside reserves. See, if this is a business decision, right? A business property, you don't want to be paying for new refrigerators and fixing the air conditioning system and fixing the broken toilets or replacing. You don't want to be doing all that out of your personal checking account, right? You want to be doing that from the income the property is producing. So what I might do is take that 32,000 and add maybe 10 to it. So let's just say we're going to say 45,000 is going to be our expenses. Now, before I go there, there's one other thing that jumps out at me, to me, on this list, and that's management. Now, there's always some management expense. Now, 
people say, well, no, because I'm going to manage it myself. Okay, but there's still a management expense because your time, I would assume, is worth something, right? It's worth something. And I mean, you could, you know, get a job at Trader Joe's or, or you know, Walmart, or I mean, it's worth something. And so there, there, you might want to think about that. Are you going to manage it yourself? Are you going to hire somebody else to manage? Now, if this were particularly multifamily, like more than four, and we were hiring a property manager, we would be spending six to ten percent of the gross income just on management expenses. So one of the things, one of the questions you have to ask, and you say this one is self-managed, so they put in zero. But does your client, the investor, want to manage it themselves? Or do they want to hire a property manager? Well, six to ten percent is what we would generally be be charging for that. And so there would be a management fee. Right. And sometimes people just say 10%. Right, because I'm telling you, that's what a lot of property managers charge that are good and they have a trust account and they're taking care of everything for the property, right? They're they're making arrangements to have the toilets fixed and they're having the roof fixed and they're paying the expenses and they're doing all that. You're looking at a 10% management fee. So over and above what they've told us the expenses are likely to be, we might have a 10% annual reserve for things that break and you should have a discussion, are you gonna manage it yourself or do you wanna hire a manager? If they've already hired a manager and they say, I got a manager, well, what does that manager cost, you know, charge? And we would be plugging those numbers in also. I'll, uh, what I have found from doing this is, is that before we go through this quick, this is a quick um, analysis, before we do this, it is really good to have all those numbers figured out in advance because some of them are difficult to change once we've clicked on submit all right i know it says you can edit it some of them are difficult to edit all right i'm just telling you some of them are difficult to edit and the only way to make a significant change usually is to create a second scenario with different numbers annual growth and in income growth rate Okay, so how much are rents going up over time? Now, you can see, you know, back, it goes up and down and it goes up and down. So it's 2972. Um, this one doesn't necessarily tell us what it was back then, but my other program would, would give me an idea. If you Google search, what is the annual appreciation of rent in San Jose, California, you would undoubtedly find something. The default setting is 3%. The question is, how much are you going to be able to raise the rent, your inflation, rent inflation factor? Is it only 3%? Do you think you're gonna be able to raise the rent 5% a year? Right, the under rent control, it's going to be the consumer price index plus a factor maximum of 10%. Um, why should we use RPR rather than our own? I don't know what that question is. If you've got a, uh, are you saying you have a competing software program to RPR, which you're going to use if you've written one and you like it, use it. But I don't understand the mean, why that's a, a question, right? Um, what we're, so there are, I have other spreadsheets, but this is the one that I would typically use. Um, so don't ask me questions about what about the spreadsheet that I put together, should I use it? Go ahead, right? I, I mean, just, uh, but, but please don't interrupt my class to ask me, to compare RPR to a spreadsheet I haven't seen. Right? Um, and we're going to go through, I'm, I'm gonna finish this. So let's, let's say when we start the fiscal year is when would the close of escrow day be, right? When would it be? Well, let's say we're looking at closing this on September 1st. Then the question is, is what is the hold period? 
right? This isn't a flip. It's a long-term hold. So I would ask my clients under, you know, when do you plan on selling it? How long do you plan on holding it? Sometimes I've had people say five years, seven years, 10 years is the maximum. This number, the loan to value ratio as a percentage is something that you're going to want to know in advance. So if you if you are buying a fourplex, you know, you could talk to Jody Hatano at Golden One Credit Union and ask her what would be the loan to value ratio on somebody buying a fourplex. And then you would want it to get that percentage. And it might be higher than 65%. It might be 70%. It could, I guess, be 75%. I would have to ask her. But this is a number you're going to want to know because it's going to affect your cash flow. And you're going to want to have an idea of what the interest rate is likely to be. Let's just assume that you can get a 70% loan to value ratio and your interest rate might be 6%, right? I believe that it might be higher on a property like this. But again, you would talk to loan agents about this. By the way, and as I mentioned, once you get to five or more units, everything changes, everything changes. Um, so we're going to hit submit. We're just going to go with this for now. And this gives us a, a the beginning of a spreadsheet. Notice that little hazard icon, right? One or more. So what RPR is doing is they're not saying, hey, dummy, you made a mistake. Not exactly. But what they're saying is we see some things that you, we don't understand. Like for example, when I, and boy, this is a lot of them. It says your sale value cap or cap rate are generating outputs that exceed values upper and lower bounds, includes the cap rate above 3% or reduce it to below 29%. All right, so we can, so we're gonna still look at that, right? Now, what the, what this is giving us is a, and that one, by the way, has a lot more things, <laughs> is what is our levered versus unlevered analysis? And for some reason, this looks like it's done something strange. I'm not um, sure. So I'm going to go down here and we're going to put in 100% occupancy. Um, we've already factored in vacancies, right? As a result of um, using 11 months, we could have not you, we could have used 12 months and then used a different vacancy factor. Um, the first year NOI is 58,534. Um, the purchase price is 192 and it's given us a first year cap rate of 3.4%. Now that might sound kind of low. You look over here, they were bragging as it were of a cap rate of about 3.73%. And that's their estimated gross rent multiplier. When you see a number that low, it's referring to an annual multiplier. It's an annual multiplier. But what we're um, multifamily residential properties have a low capitalization rate. And the reason they have a low capitalization rate is because it's hard not to make money, right? It's hard not to. I mean, they're, they're, you get, in fact, it's for a long time, it was very difficult to get anybody that would sell them simply because they've got, um, they're, they're pretty much guaranteed in terms of the income. Uh, what was the number of equity players? Um, thank you, Nicole. So what we could change that later, but are you, uh, for most purposes, we're looking at one entity buying the property. Is it possible that somebody might ask you to do an analysis where there are two partners? And is it possible that one partner is putting in more money than the other partner? So one of the things that we can do is we can say there are two or three or whatever, right? We can, we can do that. And then that would, um, how does this assessment analysis impact a seller that must do a 1031 exchange? That's a different question. Um, the 1031 exchange doesn't necessarily affect this, right? Because essentially, if somebody is doing a 1031 exchange into this property, that's basically saying where their money is coming from. 
but still the investor is going to want to know how much money am I making on my investment, right? They're gonna to wanna to know it. And that's what this is designed for. So let's cover a few of these things. And by the way, if you're in my group and you're interested um, and you've got one of these, you could let me know. So what this is saying is, um, let me just, I'm getting lots of questions. All right. There's some weird numbers here. So the cap rate, the gross valuation, on the first year is zero, right? Um, unlevered. So the difference between levered and unlevered is, let me just look at all these. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, purchase price, cash flow, value, college, trying to lose money on an unlevered analysis. Where is this? Here, let me just. You can ignore this message, otherwise fix your inputs. All right, so we're going to take a look at something. So a levered analysis, means what about a loan? And the reason why we're not doing very well at the beginning is because we have a down payment and things like that. So the purchase price is 1925. That's the cap rate and an interest rate of 6%. The internal rate of return, I mean, we're not, this is not a very good property. We're losing money. <laughs> but the internal rate of return takes a look at what the property is making, including appreciation and rent uh excuse me ex including appreciation and loan costs here i'm just going to dismiss these wow uh, there's a lot of them uh, um let me try something else while we're on this i'm going to go here because sometimes what happens is when i start this i realize that this is not a good investment right um and so here's one where they want, I'm just gonna to switch to another one, 1 1.9, but their gross income is only 93,000. You know, their average net income is 49. Let me just see what that one looks like. There's disclosures and things like that. I'm gonna try another one just for fun. Because a lot of times, once we start putting in the numbers, we end up, getting something where the numbers don't look very good. Um, right. So I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try another one quickly. I guess I should do one on how to do a flip, right? Which is a totally different one. So I'm gonna go here to matrix. I'm gonna just use their numbers for fun because I talk too much about you know all these other 93022 okay i'm going to go here 93022 enter total expenses um total expenses are 43 by the way on a lot of multifamily properties you can expect to have 40 to 50 percent of expenses right when you include everything wrong wrong one and i'm going to put this in here and hit enter, and we're going to assume a 5% annual growth. And I'm going to leave this at 65. So here's would be the different equity players. We can have two on this one. We hit submit. Let's see if this gives us a better. Let's see if it, ah, notice there's a lot fewer ones. All right. So this cap rate is only 2.85%. All right. Um, the when we mess with cap rate so we're going to say it's 100 percent occupied we might have a or let's say 95 percent occupied that's allowing for a five percent vacancy factor right which would be a relatively common one and if the purchase price was 1.9 so what are we getting is we're getting a 2.85 percent cap rate now, if our client said, well, that's not good enough, 1,850,000, we hit enter. And one of the nice things about this program is when I make that change, notice it's bumped up the cap rate a little bit. But the cap rate over time is going to go up 
And the reason why at the beginning, we're not getting a, a bigger number is because we have a down payment and we have other things that are taken into consideration, right? And so this gives us a first year cap rate of 2.92. Now, if the client said, well, I'm not going to do it unless I get at least 3.25, um, that's my, my sweet spot for a cap rate, then what it's going to do, notice what happens is it changes the price. So depending upon the cap rate, the price would vary. Depending upon the price, the cap rate would vary, assuming that our expenses stay the same. Now, the sale cap rate, which is over here, asks the question, when we sell it, what would be a capitalization rate that a buyer would expect on a property like that? Now, again, we're talking about something that's going to happen in 10 years, right, into the future, which is sort of hard to predict. But 5%, by the way, for multifamily in California is pretty high. Right? I'm just saying because oftentimes the, the cap rate is a reflection of risk and it isn't considered to have a lot of risk. But let's say we want to do, we, we assume that if we had a 4% cap rate, when we sell it, it would be crazy and everybody would love it. And so what that's going to do is change the estimate of what the sales price is likely to be. And notice this number down here is, is that the property growth value is going to be 62.18%, right? That would be how much the value is going to go up over time. And again, we'd be looking at appreciation. So the net cash flow, uh, unlevered means without a loan is that, much, what would the value be? This is with, with the loan. Internal rate of return looks at what our return is given appreciation and other, other expenses. How did you determine that was a bad investment? The reason the other one, um, I stopped playing with it is because the numbers were all coming out zero. And there was a whole lot of things that I would have to go in and fix. And I frankly don't have that much time to go in and look at all of them. So I went for a simpler one where the numbers don't need as much fixing. Levered analysis, there isn't a lot to do here except that there's graphs and charts and things like that, but I don't really use it. Rent roll, this becomes important in that, uh, welcome, yeah, yeah, roll has been created. Thank you for explaining this to me. There we go, there we go, there we go, all right. Um, yes, just stop. Okay, exit. All right. So here are the different units. Notice here's the monthly rent. If we believe that they are going to go up, we could change it. And the renovated is an important thing for us to look at. Have these units been recently renovated? If the answer is the answer, yes or no. Now, remember, I was using a 10% factor on the other example. If we had the information and we knew that in unit number two, we're going to have to replace the, the kitchen at some point, or we're going to have to replace a bathroom at some point, we could put in renovation. We, we could put that in, right? But I'm just looking at it. Cash flow is the tab that answers the question of um, how much is the cash flow. And notice it's given us here over the starting month, the rent over 12 months using the 5% as a annual appreciation. A lot of questions. How can we use this for a single family home investment too? It works pretty much the same way. So a management fee would be, if we were hiring a manager, we'd be putting in six or 10%. Then here are the different numbers. And some of the things is there other income, for example, do we make money from the laundry? You could put that in, um, you know, termination fees sometimes come in. Here's a renovation schedule where you could put in whether or not there's units are going to need renovation um, and purchase and sale, lots of questions. Well, is there a general cap rate that is appealing to investors? What is the lowest cap rate that a buyer would be willing to start with? Cap rates vary significantly depending upon the property type. 
the cap rate is a indication among other things of the level of risk. So for example, if your investor was buying an apartment building, that would have generally a very low cap rate because there's very low risk. They're easy to rent out. If they were buying a office building, office buildings right now have very high risk, which would mean although you could be having under 4% for a multifamily residential, but it could be seven or 9% for the retail type spaces. And that's because there's a lot more risk in that. So the question for an investor isn't necessarily what cap rate do you want? Because generally people say five, right? Because I hear this a lot. I want at least a 5% cap rate. I want a 6% cap rate, right? But it, it's, it, it's related to who the tenant is. For example, if it was a commercial retail building in Starbucks, Apple, Amazon, somebody like that is the tenant, there's very low risk, right? Because they're not struggling to pay their rent, right? So you got almost no risk at all. So the cap rate is going to be low, but let's say you were buying a property that was a, you know, a taqueria or something, and that's a drive-through, and you just don't know, right? You, you enter, there are a lot of factors, or an independent hardware store, right? Is is the is the tenant? What happens if Lowe's opens up a new location? They're going to be on the ropes. So the cap rate varies dramatically depending upon the type of property. It also varies depending upon the investor's willingness to assume a risk. Um, so this is about purchase and sale. Um, what it would give us is an idea over time, right? At the end of 10 years, that there would be net sale proceeds would be 2697 given the appreciation rate we put in. Now we could fine tune this by are we going to list it with a real estate broker? Let's say yes, and it's 3%, right? It could be here, I'll make this five just to make you guys happy. Uh, recording fees and transfer tax, we could calculate that by using an app from a title company. But what this would be giving us is at the end of the 10 year holding period, this is the number we might wanna get. When we sell it, this is the loan payoff which would give the investor an idea of what the rate of return is. Um, lots of questions here. All right. So uh, an internal rate of return takes into consideration appreciation, takes into consideration loan amounts. Um, if it was unlevered, anyhow, uh, cash on cash return, notice if it's levered, we're not actually making a, as much of a profit. And that's because the loan costs and the leverage costs. If it's a cash investment, then we don't have the loan costs and our rate of return goes up. Um, sources of funds is just a tab where we can talk about the loan amount and the interest rate. And notice we could change the loan to value ratio. The one number that it doesn't let us easily change is what the gross income is going to be. So if somebody said, well, what if I put down 50%, right? Then what that's going to do is change all the numbers, right? It'll increase the internal rate of return. It'll increase, now, now you'll notice we have a cash on cash return that, that now exists because we've lowered the loan to value ratio. And, um, anyhow, um, and, Let's just, one, let me just do something quickly. All right, let's just say I want an active single family home. Um, I'll do another class on flips because frankly, I, we just didn't have time. I, for some reason, I always think that I'm gonna run out of time, but then, you know, let's, but then that usually doesn't happen. And let's just say 1 million or less. Right? There are some in San Jose, not a lot. And we want, well, let's just find some. That's a lot. Oh, how about this? That should, oops, that should narrow it down some 77. Okay, let's just 
really narrow it down, there are 12. Many of these are coming soon. Let's just pick an easy one. They're a beautiful house, a beautiful house, 95128. So let's say you had a client that, and it's pretty much the same thing we've been going through, but they were interested in buying this as a rental. We would click on RPR, we would load RPR, we would go down to evaluate, we would hit continue, and it's going to give us, it wants me to remove, it wants me to remove, um, click here. So we're going to get rid of, I, I thought I'd already done this. How about this one and this one and this one? we're going to delete those. All right, so now let's go back. All right, oh, thank you. I'm just gonna keep one. Oh, it's, I, I have to go into another spot in order to delete, because you can only have five at any one time. And I've got too many of them open for it to be happy with me right now. So, um, oh, I'm not gonna keep fighting with this. <laughs> so um, I have to get rid of some of these, which requires me to look at it. But if we were analyzing a single family home, it would be exactly the same that we went through. It would ask us, what do we think the gross income would be? Well, what would we be able to rent it for? We would subtract expenses. We would put in something for reserves. We would, and it would do the same sort of calculation. Next time I'll do a flip, if you would like that. I don't know if you guys would feel like that. I'll do a flip. Um, if you've got something and you're in my group on my team and you would like to, you know, um, some help with it, let me know. I've done too many of these in my, my life, but um, it seems like our time is up for today. All right. And I'll do, next time I'll do a flip. Doesn't that sound like fun? Maybe not next week, but soon. Um, and I'll find a fixer upper and it'll be, it'll be a lot of fun. All right. Thank you everybody for participating. It's complicated sometimes. That's why I spend some time helping agents with it. By the way, if you're really interested in working with investment properties, it wouldn't hurt for you to take some courses in this. And there are a lot of courses that you could, you could work with. Um, and Jody would like to say something about rates before we go. All right, Jody, what I need to do is to find you on the list. Where are you, Jody? All right, you can speak. Speak. Hi buddy. there, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, great. I no, I just it. wanted to just one whole second. Just real quick mention because I'm, I'm sure you all heard the Fed announcement yesterday that they raised the Fed rate um, by three quarters of a point. It says that you should be able to speak. Can you provide a list of courses I'd recommend? Yes. But Jody, it says that you, unmuted, you muted, muted, you're going back and forth. I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Uh, thanks. Still not hearing anything. Um, you can hear Jody. All right. Yes, I can I hear. I don't know why I can't hear Jody. I would like to hear Jody. Oh. Everybody else well, can I'll hear just... you. So the important people can hear you, Jody. So go ahead. I'll stop talking. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll put a little message in. I just wanted to let everyone know that um, with the Fed announced, you know, of course, the rate increase yesterday, three quarters of a point. We all expected that. Actually, thought maybe they would even go a point, but they didn't. So. Um, three quarters of a point, pretty aggressive, but that actually had a positive impact on mortgage bonds and the bond market overall. So we lowered rates on our jumbo loans this morning by an eighth of a point all across the board. 
we're not the only lender that did that. I've talked to some of my counterparts at other places and they've all gone down just a little bit. I don't expect it to stay that way for a little while, but you know, for now, let's go with it and uh, get out there, you know, call some of your people that have objected to, you know, purchasing or even selling and because they just focus on rate, 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 just say, hey, give Jody a call, rates went down. And um, let me kind of have that conversation with them and uh, see if we can convert some of your, you know, leads into actual closed loans or closed transactions, okay? <laughs> So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. You guys have my number, call me anytime. I'll probably get with Mike next week, maybe try to do a presentation to try to help you know everyone understand a little bit more detailed what all of this means um, and what it's, what it's gonna do to the housing market. Sounds good. I can hear you now, Jody. It was a uh, speaker change. <laughs> but anyhow, it's hard to talk and manipulate things. Well, thank you very much for that. Let's do it. Um, and in fact, even we could do something, I don't know if you talked about this, on loans for multifamily, what's the difference, that sort of stuff, since we have people that are interested. All right? All right. Thank you, everybody. That's all we got. Talk to you later. Be safe out there. See you all next week.